assist us and a little glimpse of what they see as the future. Uh, for those of you who may know me uh, from my, my 34 years of service to the state of Michigan with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services in various roles and iterations of the department, I am now um, with the Institute for Health Policy at Michigan State um, working with um, IPSER on this project. So um, for um, most of us, we know telehealth is not new. Um, Medicare began, CMS started paying for it for a Medicare population in 1999, but it was very limited, uh, primarily for rural um, underserved areas. Um, it has expanded over time. There was a huge um, surge of commercial payers in around 2016. The Medicaid in Michigan began covering it in the early to mid um, 2000s. However, um, since the pandemic, as with many things in, in the health industry, um, we have um, had a huge um, increase in activity, in innovation, efficiency, all of the things that COVID has caused um, for the healthcare industry. And so our speakers today, all of the panelists, have um, a wealth of experience uh, during, um, again, pre-pandemic pre and uh, since, since the start. So I'm going to kick it off by introducing our first speaker today. And I will again, before I do that, I will again remind everybody, if you have questions, please put them in the Q&A. We are going to take um, questions after each panelist for a brief period of time, and then we will also take questions at the end in a wrap-up format, because sometimes you'll think of questions um, as we proceed. So our first speaker um, is Seth Kabadi. He is the CEO of MSU Healthcare. He has um, been with MSU since August of 2019. Seth has 20 years of experience as Vice President of Ambulatory Operations at, for Mount Sinai Health System in New York City. He is known for his leadership to rebuild, revitalize, and optimize organizational structures to improve patient access and satisfaction. He holds a Master's in Health Administration from Hofstra University and a Bachelor's from the University of Albany. So Seth, um, I'm gonna turn it to you to uh, begin your presentation. Thank you, thanks for having me. I think Cindy is the is it Cindy is the owner of the presentation to bring that up. Here we go. Okay, great. Okay, so um, there's a quick uh, quick agenda. I'll talk a little bit about uh, MSU Healthcare. We'll define. Uh, telehealth and the types of it. We'll go through some challenges and the, the, the MSU's experience um, and then some uh, some future state and then we'll lead to some uh, some Q&A. So just a little bit about uh, MSU Healthcare. We're actually, it's a, it's a new entity. Um, so July 1 is when MSU Healthcare went live. We were previously called um, the MSU Health Team. We've actually uh, broken away from the, uh, the university. Uh, still in the umbrella of the university, I should say, but uh, an independent uh, organization as of uh, July 1. We are the, uh, we are the clinical enterprise of, um, of the university. And so uh, it allows us to have better, uh, this uh, type of, uh, of independence allows us to uh, uh, have better partners within the state and tackle healthcare within the state. And uh, telehealth will be one of, those, uh, one of those items that we can tackle better. So let's see, so I'm um, just defining, you know, tele, with telemedicine, telehealth, e-visits, televisits, uh, telephone visits. I think you know, telemedicine is probably the the kind of the the overarching uh, uh, category, and then telehealth and e-visits and uh, telephone visits sit sit in the in the box, maybe. Although, um, and honestly, it's kind of everybody's uh, you know maybe some personal opinions of telehealth and telemedicine how they interchange. But um, you know, just uh, telemedicine is the practice of caring for patients remotely. Um, so again, patient uh, or probation, uh, provider and patient not physically present. Uh, telehealth, this is really what we're talking about today, but the, the audio and video uh, streaming uh, technology to examine patients. And of course, there's e-visits, which is a communication, um, mostly through an EMR a, a portal uh, with patients, and then telephone visits, which have um, happening for quite some time now, now recently reimbursed. So next slide, Cindy. So again, need for telemedicine. Um, there's always really been a uh, been a need more than ever now during the pandemic. But um, the first uh, um, oh, slide back up. There you go. So 
um, just for some some history. So first, uh, uh, technically the first uh, I guess telemedicine uh, uh, visit was in the in the fifties with a Nebraska uh, psychiatrist uh, um, providing uh, um, uh, uh, clinical services to uh, to inmates 150 miles away to complete that. So that's quite some quite some time ago. And so again, the uh, the basics of, of telemedicine. Uh, you can provide care at a at a low cost. Um, um, the physical the physical nature, the lack of physical nature, uh, is a tremendous benefit, um, um, especially in today's world. So next slide, Cindy. Um, so types of uh, uh, so I think just maybe some of the this uh, the background of the slide may have come up. So it's my my fault here. So what types of services provided by telemedicine? Um, there we go. Uh, so uh, primary. Uh, obviously, primary and specialty uh, referral services. Uh, there's remote patient monitoring, which to, in today's world there's there's all types of remote uh, uh, remote monitoring, uh, from the the physician uh, the communication uh, with the patient to uh, all types of uh, um, tools and technologies that uh, can monitor blo uh, blood pressure and glucose. Um, so, and then medical education, which uh, we've actually taken a, a big step in that with our tele. Our telehealth and telemedicine services, um, um, because the resi our resident and fellows uh, can't be present um, in the uh, in the exam rooms. In some instances, they are now joining providers in uh, in telehealth uh, uh, visits, which is quite cool. So, next slide, Cindy. So, the components of it, um, kind of what we all what we all know, I think, in today's world. So, the equipment. There's a computer and a and a camera. Um, you do need to be close by to certain things, maybe a, a printer, a fax, or a telephone. Um, again, dual screen headsets. Some of these things are needed uh, more so on the on the provider side, but also on the uh, some on the patient side. So, uh, video conferencing platform. So, um, internet based, obviously uh, HIPAA compliant. Uh, many platforms. Uh, like we're, we use Zoom at uh, at MSU Healthcare, and we're using Zoom now. Um, there's there's other platforms out there, um, and a lot of EMR vendors. So. Uh, medical record vendors, um, they use um, their own platforms. Um, again, oddly enough, they're probably a little bit uh, clunky compared to the uh, to the uh, um, standalone or independent platforms that are out there. Um, and this this ties into the uh, the integration into the health records. Um, uh, again, when you use when there's a third party uh, platform, sometimes the integration into the EMR uh, may not be um, may not be exactly what you want. Um, but again, on the flip side, some of the EMR, um, the EMR vendors, uh, namely there's the Epics of the world, um, their telehealth platform is, um, is actually, again, some of the steps to using it is still a little uh, clunky or needs some refining. So uh, next slide, Cindy. So we're gonna, uh, the next few slides, we'll talk about uh, asynchronous and uh, uh, synchronous um, types of telehealth. So, um, store and forward telemedicine, right? So they have a camera. Um, this is a, in dermatology. Um, a, a, a picture can be taken and sent um, from the patient to the provider uh, or back and forth. Um, and, and then there can be some sort of um, diagnosis or some uh, explanation. Um, there's also radiology. Uh, this is probably the most, uh, the most common as far as uh, images being taken and then radiologists doing reads, right? So it actually, it's a, it's a form of telemedicine. Um, and then we'll get into the into today's world where there's a uh, monitoring so blood pressure blood sugar weight um, fitbits you can you know um, they they track a lot of these things uh, uh, these days so uh, next uh, slide to me so synchronous this is more what we're what we're involved in in today's world into the the real time telemedicine I'm in a, in a, a secure portal um, you can even have patients access some uh, we'll call tele devices. So that's a telestethoscope, a dermoscope. Um, these are things that actually attach to the computers and, and uh, can be used. So a dermoscope uh, allows a, a provider to have a, a deeper look into a, um, uh, into a patient's uh, lesion. Um, and so these are things that, again, all done via telehealth. The equipment needs to be there. But uh, again, things that weren't really, you know, uh, available so many years ago. So, uh, Cindy, next slide. So I will talk to a little bit about the history and um, what telehealth is and defining it. So now we'll talk about the MSU experience. So um, the telehealth, it really wasn't, uh, it was uh, as expansion or going from zero to 60 at, uh, at MSU. So we, 
we did, you know, pre-COVID, we had pockets of telehealth, which probably, you know, a lot of a lot of health systems in the country um, had that. Some of them are were uh, were farther along, but I would say we were, you know, towards the middle of the pack. We had some uh, some services. What's in bold here is bolded is actually what the services we had uh, pre-COVID. Again, pockets they were more so doctor to doctor or doctor to um, doctor to a hospital, and we had a few clinics that were doing. Uh, um, uh, doctor to patient. Um, and then the whole list, we, we went live with all of our specialties. We actually, it took us um, uh, 10 days. Um, so uh, to be fully blown with telehealth, uh, full telehealth services uh, um, and all, all capacity. Um, and uh, um, this is all again, namely because of the legislature changing to, uh, to reimburse telehealth visits at a really a full E&M visit. Uh, next slide, Cindy. So uh, our, impl our, uh, our implementation, so it was a, a really a six phase approach. So we started off with current patients, um, then we got into a new patients, uh, then we did tele televisits as they became uh, reimbursable. Uh, then we did telehealth from home. What that means is actually the, the provider could do the telehealth visits uh, from home. Uh, then we had residents um, access and uh, um, become part of, the, part of the visit, part of the training. Um, we had developed a more streamlined uh, psych, uh, um, psychiatry workflow. Uh, we, we then incorporated in phase four the interpreter and then new patients to the, to the system, which again, a little bit more complicated because if someone doesn't have a, um, a, a medical record number uh, in order to get that, you know, there's a few more steps to, to that as far as getting access to the, to the EMR and to uh, Zoom. And then we got into multidisciplinary a clinic where we had two or three specialists, uh, providers on the on the phone um, or on the uh, on on the Zoom, and this is where we're at now. We're we're really um, um, are really pushing the multidisciplinary. It's huge in uh, um, in uh, our cancer our cancer center. Um, we also, what's not on here is we we do a lot of tele PT. We're actually getting a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, 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 getting noticed for that. There's a lot of presentations going out, and so our tele PT. So physical therapy and occupational therapy is going quite well. Um, so next slide, Cindy. So again, the team for telemedicine, much like the, the team when you'd have in a, in a visit, right? The physician, the nurse, um, there's some technology part, meaning the EMR, and then there's the care team. And so really a telehealth visit is, as far as the participants and the, the folks acting behind the scenes, not so much different than a, than a regular E&M visit, oddly enough. Next slide, Cindy. So um, this was uh, this is our, our really our the Michigan uh, the state of Michigan where our our, uh, our scope is our landscape of uh, of, uh, of telemedicine. Um, this was actually pre was there wasn't many dots on here pre COVID so post COVID um, they, they just are a sprinkling of, of dots you can see where they are around the around the uh, around the state a lot of them in uh, um, the eastern part of the, the state near near Detroit oddly enough. Um, so the next um, next slide. And then we're, we've gone across the, across the state, or across the country, across the state and, and the country. We really, our students that were, you know, back in March and in April when they were sent back home, or um, employees were, everyone sent back, uh, back home, uh, we end up being able to connect with a lot of the, the students, and you can see the, the breadth of where we're, we're touching as far as telehealth visits across the, uh, the country is, uh, is uh, um, quite big. Um, next slide, Cindy. So this is a, we took a sampling of our, our practices and so it, it shows the face-to-face, the -face, uh, this is pre and post COVID, so face-to-face -face virtual visits, phone and phone visits. And so you can see, you know, obviously in the beginning of uh, April, we're all face-to-face -face, and then as COVID hit, we then uh, went to a hybrid model and we're, our visit, total visit volumes, again, this is through June, we're kind of Back up to at least you know 80 or 90 percent of what we of what we were in this group of um, this group of clinics, and so this is still this is still holding true. We still do uh, we still do plenty of, uh, of uh, telemedicine visits. Um, certainly uh, um, across a uh, primary care, our neurology and, and cancer are big service lines that are are doing uh, still doing plenty of telehealth, and frankly, probably will for the next uh, 12 months or until a. Uh, until uh, a vaccine is uh, um, put out there for uh, for COVID, but um, uh, we we are um, 
like I said, even in, in uh, um, doing telept, and it's it's still strong. And in, um, again, probably about ten or fifteen percent of our visits are still telemedicine as of as of today. At the same time, we're lo we're looking to grow programs that maybe didn't have um, telehealth uh, as a as a strong point before. So we we have contracts to manage a lot of uh, nursing homes and rehab um, rehab facilities, and so we're really we're really pumping in the the telehealth to those. Um, to those uh, um, contracts, um, and obviously we also have a lot of contracts with health systems that we're starting to offer the the, the telehealth visits to those type of vendors. So next slide, Cindy. Hmm, there we go. Anticipated challenges. I think one the, the once the other side of the slide's not coming up. That's okay though. Um, so there we go. Anticipated challenges. So. We did, uh, you know, the um, the literacy, the IT literacy of the of the of the, uh, the patients. Um, uh, it, it needed to be higher than 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 we than we thought. There were some challenges around it. There were some challenges around the uh, uh, geriatric population as far as um, getting on to the the telehealth visits. Um, you know, so historically, um, and again before I before I arrived in uh, in Michigan, oddly enough, at uh, um, my previous employer in New York City. The highest usage of tele of telehealth in your the e, the portal was the geriatrics population. It actually wasn't the patients themselves. It was their their family members. It was their um, uh, their their assistants. Their uh, whoever the caregiver was for them was was doing that because it would be easier for them. Um, but now in in a, in a pandemic, the, a lot of those those family members they weren't at home with them. They couldn't be at home with them anymore. And so their kind of uh, the geriatrics population was kind of left on their own to um, to navigate the IT part of it, and so that was a little bit of a, a of a challenge for us. There's also a fear of, oddly enough, fear of insurance coverage for whatever reason. Um, the the telehealth visit, um, you know, even though it was you know passed by you know legislature um, uh, that uh, uh, the visits were covered, there still was a fear that it wasn't only because of pre-COVID uh, pre-COVID scenarios. So, and then lack of understanding around telemedicine. We actually had to do a marketing campaign. To um, to get to patients about telemedicine, about what it was, what it meant, what it could do. Um, that we we um, uh, we were surprised by how much we had to um, to do. And then um, on the provider side, well, we had some some redis resistance in in adopting it, but um, all in all, I think it was uh, enormously uh, um, successful. Um, and there were some resources to it. Um, there were some there's some IT uh, IT heavy resources to get the um, to, to get a patient on, get the doctor on, um, get everybody uh, um, connected to actually do the visit. So next, uh, next slide, Cindy. So again, why now, right? So, um, so far, smartphones are are uh, obviously there's a big increase in, in smartphones over the last uh, um, seven to eight years. Um, but uh, more importantly, we're in a we're in a pandemic. I mean, the telehealth visit is the is the perfect solution to where we are. And frankly, it was. It was probably even a perfect solution pre-COVID, but and with the with the reimbursement and the um, uh, getting paid for it, that's what that's what makes it um, uh, more of a uh, uh, of a reasonable tool right now. So, uh, next slide. And so this was mentioned before. So it really is the digital health, um, which is a telehealth. We'll say is a component of our telemedicine. This really is the it's the future of, of where uh, of healthcare. Um, a lot of times, healthcare is kind of last to the game when it comes to technology. Um, and so, uh, you know, again, with the with where we're at with uh, EMRs and medical technology, we 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 are kind of healthcare does kind of fall um, fall kind of last again to the to the world as opposed to the entertainment world. But um, um, we're now it, it really is the is the the future of of healthcare as far as uh, uh, digital health is concerned. Next slide. We have a few minutes. So again, mobile uh, mobile phone ownership. This is uh, common sense of a, an increase in it, and the uh, really is helping the ability for for telehealth and, and monitoring. Next slide, Cindy. So bandwidth. There's a gr greater greater bandwidth. Um, you know, we there is obviously still a lot of rural areas and urban areas that are. Lacking in uh, in bandwidth, but for the most part, the um, bandwidth is only only uh, uh, growing and getting better. Uh, next slide, Cindy. So again, the connected devices talked about uh, this a little bit uh, 
earlier on in the in the presentation. But the the advancement in these connected devices is devices. They've actually they, they've been there for a while. It's just the telehealth piece and the reimbursement hadn't caught, hasn't caught up to it, and now now it has. Um, but again, it took COVID in order to get the the uh, uh, really the the telehealth visits um, uh, covered to where they should be. Um, and so again, the, there's a there's just so many opportunities with the connected devices that we can do from a, uh, a medical perspective. Um, at the same time, um, the, the idea of, of telemedicine, not everything needs to be telemedicine. You can have a hybrid model, which is this is our, um, one of our service uh, lines of hemophilia. They've actually been doing uh, the hybrid model of meaning telemedicine in the, in the physical outreach for a few years now and monitoring the, um, in the pediatric world. Um, they will do the more acute visits in person, and then the, the monitoring visits uh, or the check-ins, um, they will do it by telemedicine, and they're connecting, you know, across the state all the way up to the, to the, to the UP. And again, this is one of our service lines that have use telehealth uh, the most robustly. Um, next slide. Okay, so the, the insur uh, insurance influence on adoption. So Kathleen mentioned a little bit about this, about 2001 in Medicare. Uh, paying for virtual uh, visits, and then uh, and then May May twenty uh, May first of twenty twenty. This is again COVID. The world changed uh, for reimbursement for um, for telephone. Again, this is this is the May the May first twenty twenty. That is reimbursing as a as an E and M visit. Um, um, that's the uh, different than uh, pre COVID world. Next slide, Cindy. And get through. So insurance uh, influence on adoption back to twenty. Uh, 2016. Um, this was uh, the Blue Cross and Blue Shield network. They had put these rules in place again, not reimbursing it fully as E and M visits. And again, the, it's a, a little bit different how we are right now. But these were put in place in 16. There was was an uptick in telehealth. Um, still, telehealth, I would say at that that time, there's still the there's still a lot of a lot of visits that weren't type of care that wasn't covered, and you still had to pay out of pocket, which was uh, for whatever reason, the forty-nine dollar charge was uh, as popular within the in the country. Uh, next slide. Then the the growth. I'll skip through some of these. Uh, um, uh, these are kind of uh, obvious growth with the pandemic with the telehealth. Next slide. So why do we need it? So um, the the travel, the reducing of the of the travel in a pandemic, um, not having to travel, whether it's a uh, 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 public transportation or your own transportation, the reduce reducing and spreading of the of uh, uh, of the disease. These are all things that make uh, 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 virtual visits more important than ever right now. Um, we've actually done a lot of uh, uh, we did COVID testing in uh, disparate neighborhoods or low income uh, neighborhoods, and uh, uh, whenever when we ever positives or it was actually more so on the on the um, the negatives, uh, we were still were connecting with patients that were negative for, for COVID, but we found out other things about them, other diagnosis, and then we were able to connect them to uh, one of our, our physicians for uh, telehealth. So this was a great, uh, um, something that we wouldn't have been able to do in the, in the pre-COVID world. All right, so let's see, I have a few, uh, few seconds left. So I will go to the next, uh, next slide. Um, this is just a cost comparison of, uh, um, uh, of a, of a telemedicine visit versus an in, in-person visit. And these are actually patient costs, the travel costs. Um, so again, some of these are kind of uh, obvious that the telehealth world is, uh, um, uh, is a more efficient way and cost-effective way for the patients to, to do healthcare. Next slide. So again, future needs. So we do need to streamline the EMR integration. Like I said before, um, Oddly enough, some of the EMR vendors out there, their telehealth platforms uh, are not uh, not so uh, again so clunky as far as the integration. Um, but uh, the patient-centric and accessibility that is uh, it's uh, it's where I'm a huge huge advocate for patient access, um, and so telehealth is a, 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 a vector for it. And then the the promotion of telehealth. I think again, patients are still trying to wrap their brain around um, some of the type of uh, visits that can be done in telehealth, the complexity of them, and though there's things that we have to take on as far as uh, promoting. And um, so that's uh, I guess I'll end I'll end there. I'll wrap wrap it up. Hopefully that's with my last slide. Right. Cool. All right. I will pass the mic. Thank you, Seth. 
And right now I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A box. We'll keep an eye out um, for questions as we proceed. Thank you for that excellent information. <clears throat> now we'll move on um, to that other university um, down the road. I'm happy to introduce um, Dr. Chad Ilimutu. He, Ilimutu, sorry. Um, he is gonna be speaking on telehealth and growth and outcomes at Michigan Medicine and beyond. Dr. Eli Moodle is a, um, an adjunct professor and practicing urologist at the University of Michigan. He has used virtual care with his patients um, since well before um, COVID, beginning in 2016. He is director of telehealth for the urology department and has led growth of virtual care in his department from 50 to 1,000 visits per month. He is also the director of University of Michigan's telehealth research incubator where he leads a large portfolio of research projects related to optimizing the delivery of virtual care. His innovative policy research has been quoted in the New York Times, the Washington Post, Modern Healthcare, and he has spoken across the country on virtual care, including NPR and Freakonomics Radio. So I'm very happy to introduce Dr. Ali Moodle. All right, thanks. Sorry, I was just little technical issues for someone who is focused on telehealth. But um, thanks. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, um, to present today in, in front of this audience. I'm super excited to be here uh, to talk about a topic that I'm very passionate about. Um, as Kathy mentioned, I've, as a clinician, I've been performing video visits with my patients um, for since about 2016 on the operations side. Um, I've been helping the Department of Urology expand their program and then uh, through the Institute of Healthcare Policy and Innovation at University of Michigan, I'm the director of the Telehealth Research Incubator where we study the impact of telehealth on healthcare costs, quality access, and uh, the patient experience. And so um, I've, what I've done is I've split this talk up into two sections. Uh, the first talk, first part of it, I'll talk a little bit about Michigan medicine, the growth that we've seen, which has been very similar to what Seth presented for the uh, Michigan State University. And, uh, and then I'll also talk about the state of Michigan um, overall as well. And then the second part, um, I want to present sort of a conceptual framework um, and some data to think about what the impact of telehealth will be on disparities, on costs and then also on clinical outcomes, which has really uh, become a important part, part of the policy discussion. Um, I won't go into a lot of details about Michigan Medicine. I think Seth, Seth did an excellent job of covering the different types of telehealth that are available. We, we're doing a similar volumes and similar modalities at Michigan Medicine. Um, when the pandemic hit, uh, we've had a surge, uh, just like many other institutions in the use of telehealth. For video visits, we're around 38 to 40,000 visits per month, e-visits, as Seth mentioned, these asynchronous interactions through questionnaires or photos. We're doing about 500 of those a month. E-consults, which are doctor-to-doctor -doctor, um, interactions, uh, about 400 of those a month. We have a telestroke program and a remote patient monitoring program. And I'll talk a little bit more about the remote monitoring over the next couple slides, uh, because I think it's an important part of uh, the future of telehealth. But um, you know, as this data slide here shows, it's really been used across all different specialties, um, orthopedic surgery, urology, um, internal medicine, and all specialties here uh, for the most part have adopted telehealth to some, to some extent. Um, and just briefly talking about patient, remote patient monitoring, because I do think this is a big part of how healthcare will be, um, or where the future of telehealth will be. And this is the concept, the general concept behind patient, remote patient monitoring is trying to take care of patients while they're at home rather than um, having to see them in clinic or um, having them come to the hospital. So trying to keep them at home and taking the information you need to uh, manage them at home. That's the general concept hundreds of different vendors out there, hundreds of different modalities to do it. But in, in general, it usually uses Bluetooth enabled blood pressure cuffs, temperature probes, uh, scales for weight, um, and using video and text to try to manage that patient at home. And so uh, at Michigan Medicine, we've used it in a number of different areas, uh, pockets, um, and we were using it to streamline some of the COVID care, uh, being able to watch patients who may be at high risk at home instead of admitting them to the hospital, and then also trying to have patients uh, be sent home earlier to help uh, free up hospital capacity. So uh, this is one example of a success that we've had with home monitoring program. This is 
um, a patient that we've treated here. He's 38 years old. He unfortunately has uh, type 1 diabetes, some severe form of it, uh, heart failure, liver disease, and is on dialysis. And so um, a, a patient that has this many illnesses is prone to having a lot of healthcare utilization. And so uh, from January to March, there was eight emergency room visits and nine hospitalizations that resulted from, um, you know, from complications or issues that he had. So we monitored, we put him into our monitoring program. We had a team that was monitoring weight gain, his labs, uh, blood pressure, and also coordinating a lot of care with the specialist through text message and um, through other interactions. And because of that, uh, the last update that I have is from, from, from May 2020, no, uh, no readmissions. And this is a, a great way of how um, medicine can be managed in the future um, starting now. Um, and, and with telehealth, there's um, a lot of different use cases. I know we, we often talk about telehealth for social distancing, and that was the reason that it really took off recently. But in reality, there's a lot of other ways that telehealth is being used. And these are different patient populations um, that can benefit from telehealth. And even prior to the pandemic, this is, these are patient populations that benefited um, from you know, in, in my own clinical practice. So patients who had to travel far for specialist care, there's uh, certain types of conditions where patients were traveling two to three hours to seek care for a 15 minute consultation. Uh, patients that can't take time off of work very easily. And we have stories of patients whose diseases have advanced because they just can't take time off to go see a physician to, uh, to follow up on a symptom or sign that they're having. Uh, patients that have transport challenges. So I have patients that have uh, neurological diseases that affect their bladder and uh, they're wheelchair bound um, and doing a 15 minute uh, consultation for them can take about a half a day. So that's another area where video consultations can be very beneficial. And then also patients that are looking for second opinions on their health care. Um, they've been diagnosed with a, with a type of cancer and they want to seek multiple opinions before they make final decisions on plans. So a lot of uses for telehealth uh, beyond social distancing, which is what we've primarily been using it for uh, recently. Um, and so just to give you a glimpse of what um, has been happening um, at Michigan Medicine in terms of virtual care as a result of the pandemic, um, again, we had some baseline telehealth here at University of Michigan, but the pandemic helped really uh, get things going. And so this graph shows a timeline, week by week timeline of um, from March until the end of July. Uh, the gray line here represents the total care that was delivered. That's the gray line. The red line represents in-person care. The yellow represents phone calls. And then the blue represents video consultations. And you can see, just like every other health system, it looks very similar to set slides, that there was a big drop in outpatient care um, at, uh, during March, a lot of drop in in-person care. And then virtual care started to salvage some of that, not all of it, but did salvage some of that drop. Um, when we went from April to May, we saw that virtual care, both phone and video was making up about 75, 80% of the care that was being delivered, um, keeping patients at home, uh, protecting staff and protecting uh, patients from, um, uh, for, you know, for social distancing purposes. And that's kind of what happened in May and April, we had this steady state. And now in June and July, as healthcare systems are becoming safer for patients to go to, there's precautions that are being put in and patients feel more comfortable. What we're seeing is that there's a rebound in care. We're almost at pre-COVID pre, pre levels for total care. Um, and then we also saw there was a drop in um, telehealth and virtual care as well. And so at this point, at the end of July and August, we're at about 16 to 20% of our total care is being delivered virtually. So it's certainly a, a lot more than pre-COVID, but not as, much, uh, not as much as earlier in the pandemic. And the trends are actually very, very specialty specific. So you have um, uh, specialties like orthopedic surgery, for example, where most of the rebound was all in-person care. And then for psychiatry, um, we see the opposite effect where there was a switch over to virtual care and that virtual care switch over really sustained and is even sustaining now where the vast majority of care is being done virtually. So um, specialty specific differences. Um, when we look across the state of Michigan, so this is data from Blue Cross Blue Shield, uh, PPO claims, insurance claims for the entire state. Um, on the, on the y-axis are monthly encounters, and you can see a very similar trend. Anytime you look at this data, it's a very similar trend. Total drop in outpatient care um, and salvaged somewhat by telehealth. And uh, as we're entering May and June and um, July, you can see that the, um, the 
in-person care is coming back and the virtual care is dropping. And I think overall, we're gonna be at about 20% of total care. It will be, uh, will be virtual moving forward, at least for the foreseeable future. So my, my main takeaways here on trends in telehealth use is that um, like many health systems, Michigan Medicine experienced a surge in telehealth um, use in March 2020. But as in-person care ramps up, we're seeing a drop in telehealth um, and it will likely settle around 20% of overall um, care delivered is where I predict. Um, and the care will be highly um, specialty specific. At this point, we're seeing still same levels of care before the pandemic to now. So, um, you know, I think the idea that telehealth is being used as a substitute rather than expanding healthcare services is probably what we're seeing right now. We don't know what it's going to look like in the future, but at least that's where it is now. Um, so moving and pivoting to the second part of the talk, I want to talk a little bit about some of the key considerations that are going to be important moving forward in the policy space for, for telehealth, namely uh, disparities in care. Um, two would be costs of care, which is a big important topic, and then of course um, outcomes and clinical outcomes of care. So I'll talk specifically about uh, disparities in care. Um, and so there's been a lot of conversations about populations that um, where telehealth may may leave some populations behind and for example older adults um, and you know I, I like to not, not necessarily think about it as a specific population but really about um, there's uh, there's essential elements that are necessary to make a successful telehealth visit. And so um, it may not be a specific population that lacks um, these essential elements, but they may lack more than one of these elements, or uh, they may actually be quite fine to do telehealth visits. And so these essential elements are number one is access to high speed internet. And this is really important. Um, I've conducted video visits with patients that are um, in the UP um, and, um, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about a very important topic, like a new diagnosis of cancer. And um, if, my, if, if what I'm saying is slower than the video that they're seeing or the video that they're seeing is slower than what I'm saying, it could be very distracting if the internet is not fast enough to, to, to give um, a synchronous um, experience. And um, that could be pretty critical when you're delivering bad news or um, talking about a complex topic. Trust and comfort is really important. There's, as Seth pointed out, a lot of patients still have concerns about the security of these visits and privacy of these visits. Um, they need to have access to connected devices. Seth showed some nice slides of how the devices are increasing, but of course there's still um, individuals that don't have the devices to connect. Language concordance, um, it, it may be okay if you have a good interpreter system built into the virtual care program, but if you don't, then that could be a problem technological literacy, being able to use the tech and troubleshoot small problems, especially if the uh, practice doesn't have a strong tech team that's helping patients. Um, and then also easy access to additional health services. That's really important too. Some patients that have complex needs um, don't just rely on that 15 minute doctor visit, but also but rely a lot on the nursing staff that they see when they come in for their clinics. And so that's a population that needs to be considered too. And so again, these are the elements that can leave page populations behind. And then there are some populations that may be at high risk for having one or more of these elements. And so older adults, for example, um, comfort with technology, uh, rural patients that have access, um, lack of access to broadband in some areas in the state, um, low income populations may have a, avail a lack of availability of connected devices, racial and ethnic minorities. Um, there are some data out there about how um, there may be a lack of distrust with the healthcare system non-English speakers, and again, patients that have complex needs. So these are the populations that we sort of need to focus on for policy targets um, to make sure that um, they're not left behind. This is some nice data from um, some colleagues over at Harvard um, that was published in JAMA that looked at digital access. So digital access they defined as um, computer with high-speed internet or um, a smartphone with the data plan. So one of these are necessary to connect, and that's what they define as um, digital access. And as you can see, um, across populations that you may expect, um, there is a lower lack of digital access uh, compared to the counterparts. So um, less than 100% of the federal po poverty level, about 50% of low income um, individuals lack uh, digital access, um, higher lack of digital access among uh, Black and Hispanic patients, and then patients that are over the age of 80 uh, tend to have a higher lack of digital access. And so, um, you know, these numbers aren't 100%, obviously, but clearly that there's some disparity that needs to be addressed. Um, these data from, are from some colleague, uh, colleagues at University of Michigan just came out today. 
um, concerns about telehealth visits. And this is a large national poll uh, that are of, of adults that are aged 50 to um, 50 to 80 that they recently surveyed and asked about telehealth experiences. The full the full um, report is available on the website below, and they asked some key questions about the visits. And so there were some. It wasn't viewed completely favorably. In fact, there was about two thirds of, of the older adults said that they didn't feel like the quality of care was the same as in person visits. Um, they felt a lack of um, personal connection, and then um, there were some technical issues too. About a quarter of them had some difficulty hearing or seeing healthcare providers. I think that a part of this has to do with the fact that this is early on. We were under emergency circumstances to get telehealth going. And so the question is, if we take these types of feedback and this information, can we, can we improve the experience for all populations? And that should be the goal rather than, you know, telehealth is not good and we should not, not, um, not cover it anymore. Um, and this is what we're finding in our own data too. While there are populations that have, that, um, have a, a more challenges with telehealth, we do see that across a lot of populations, we're still seeing high levels of adoption. And so these are data from Blue Cross Blue Shield um, in the state of Michigan, our analytic group put together, looking at uh, different populations. So income below the median um, in the state, um, rural populations and patients that are over 80. And you can see the black bars represent telehealth use prior, or gray represents um, prior to the pandemic, and then the black represents after the, uh, the start of the pandemic, which we consider March 2020. And you can see that there's big surges in all of these populations. There's a disparity in, in between low income and high income, but there's still uh, positive surges in all these populations. So, um, so my main takeaways on disparities here is that while there are differences in levels of adoption, there's no broad population that is completely excluded from this. Um, the goal should be to develop and implement policies that mitigate disparities in use. Um, examples could be development or funding community centers for education, technical support, um, supporting all efforts to expand broadband, and then providing subsidies for um, connected devices are some ideas. Um, in regard to costs, and another big area of concern with telehealth is telehealth going to um, cause a big problems to healthcare budgets. And so I think that, um, you know, we hear a lot of things. It's, I think it's important to sort of have a framework to think about costs as well. And so um, costs can come from multiple perspectives. Um, the patient's perspective, the provider's perspective, the healthcare provider's perspective, and the health system's perspective, and then also from the payer's perspective. And so from the patient's perspective, there's kind of, it could, cost could increase or decrease. And so cost could increase if their healthcare providers are doing more visits, if they have to pay expensive co-pays um, for these visits, that's potential for cost to increase. Uh, but then costs could decrease if there's no, um, you know, because of the lack of transportation costs and parking fees, as Seth presented in his talk. And so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on what we see in the data, but like most of the studies show that th these are cost savings for patients. And so there's, uh, it reduces costs for the patient and there hasn't been a lot of evidence of increased use, but time will tell as, as there's more adoption of telehealth. Uh, from the provider standpoint, costs will increase if they have to use this technology in their clinics and they're paying high subscription fees um, during the pandemic um, or now there's a, a relaxation of HIPAA rules so you can use cheap technologies or free freemium models out there out there but they may not that might not be the case in the next couple of months so uh, the expensive technology is important and then uh, but then there's also this concept that costs could decrease because um, providers don't have to use overhead staff uh, uh, they, I'm sorry they don't have to it reduces overhead because they don't have to have as much staff for these visits and you know I'm I, I think that's that's a consideration conceptually, but, um, you know, I, I don't necessarily buy that argument very well because, um, and these are some data that we have. I won't, in the interest of time, get into the details of this study, but we looked at use, using a, a method called time-driven activity-based costing, went and actually timed visits. This is prior to the pandemic, timed um, telehealth visits and in-person visits. And what we found was that healthcare providers were actually spending a little bit more time on the face-to-face interaction with the patient with the telehealth visits. And when you look at it purely from a labor cost standpoint, these are essentially the same. And um, I, I would actually argue that unless you're doing enough virtual care to be able to um, um, you know, reduce your staff in clinic, then um, for most healthcare providers, 
um, the costs are not cost savings are not going to be there. Um, and we don't know how the technology expense is going to move forward, but is going to be moving forward. But it, it, these could be potentially more expensive for healthcare providers. And then for pay, payers, there's two models. Costs can increase if there's more billable appointments, if, tel if this reduces the barrier for providers to, to conduct these visits. And then also if there's new billable services, you weren't billing for remote monitoring before, uh, but now you are billing for it. So there's a possibility that costs will increase. But then there's also this possibility that the cost could decrease if you're, you're reducing adverse events, hospitalization, low value care, and then also transportation costs, which some, some payers will cover. So, um, you know, again, at this time, and I won't go into the, these data also, but uh, at, at this time, what we see is that these slides will be available. At this time, what we see is that we're not quite sure. There's argument on both sides, but until the adoption reaches a point where we can actually measure this and there's enough volume, we don't know the exact effect on what payer costs will be. Um, so my main takeaways on telehealth and costs is that telehealth can impact healthcare spending from the payer, provider, and patient perspective. For patients, it'll likely be cost savings. For providers, it'll either be cost neutral or, or, or higher cost. Um, and then also for payers, right now it's unknown. And really ultimately, fundamentally, the effect of spending on uh, telehealth on spending is going to depend on whether it's actually used as a pure substitute for healthcare or whether it's going to end up being an expansion of traditional healthcare. And finally, um, I'll just talk about um, clinical outcomes, which is obviously very important for us to consider moving forward. And, um, you know, I think that the, what I feel about the impact of telehealth on clinical outcomes is summarized by this quote by Tim Cook. Technology is capable of doing great things, uh, but it doesn't want to do great things. It actually doesn't want to do anything. That part takes all of us. So the, the technology aspect is not going to lead to better outcomes. It's how that technology is used that will lead to better outcomes. And so um, this is a framework of thinking about how telehealth can improve clinical outcomes. So it's really about the underlying mechanism. What value are you getting from the technology? Is it a video consultation that's allowing easier access to a healthcare provider? Is it remote monitoring that's improving, that, or improving the frequency of healthcare interactions? Or is it a tool that's enabling self-management? And so with video visits, really the, the real benefit of video visits is easier access to healthcare providers. And there's few studies that have looked at clinical outcomes with video visits. There's a couple conditions, but many studies have looked at and found that there's a connection between having a specialist for certain types of diseases like sickle cell, opioid addiction psychiatrist for opioid use disorder. There's a strong connection between having that specialist and improved clinical outcomes. So if video visits and video consultations can improve that connection, then and you know, even without a randomized control trial, that this technology can lead to better, um, uh, better outcomes. And then for tools like remote monitoring, again, it's not the tool that's going to lead to ex um, outcomes. It's how that data is interpreted. And so this has been very well studied in chronic diseases like diabetes, congestive heart failure, um, COPD, and it's led to reduced hospitalizations. And so there may be some publication bias right now because the, the studies that are published are the ones that have shown some successful success in these outcomes, but there is an underlying theory and underlying mechanisms of how these, these tools can improve outcomes and that you know, we'll have to wait to see how this plays out at a population level. So my final slide here, main takeaways on telehealth and outcomes, it's not the technology, but how that technology is used that leads to better tech better outcomes. It's going to vary by condition. Um, we talked about the example of video visits and remote monitoring and how they can improve outcomes. And we'll learn more at the population level um, as it becomes used more frequently. Thank you. Thanks, Chad. <clears throat> we have a couple questions um, that I think the first one um, could go to both you and Seth. Um, are we seeing an overall patient health decline because they did not seek treatment during COVID on a timely basis, along with not having internet access. Yeah, I'm read the, go yeah, ahead. So, go ahead. Uh, yeah, I can briefly answer that. Um, I, I don't know, kind of overall at a population level, if we've seen health decline, but we do have circumstances of patients that have deferred care, um, and the re we've offered video care for any patient that um, you know prefers it, but. 60% of patients were just deferring care, whether they had access or not. So we don't know if it was an access issue, not having the technology, or if it was a preference. But because of that, we have seen uh, patients that have deferred care, symptoms worsening, um, and you know it, it was a real problem. And I think that um, we do have certain circumstances where this has happened. And I think we've reached out to those patients, at least in my practice, multiple times, offering 
um, you know, in-person care and so forth. And, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's uh, uh, the deferral of care will lead to worse outcomes. Yeah, we had the same thing. It was again the, the deferring of care. I don't know that it was because of uh, lack of access. Um, it was more so about just the um, understanding of, of telehealth and what it, what could be done with the visit and the education of you know even some of our, our own providers of what the of what we could do with telehealth. So I don't I don't know that the internet access had a had a component uh, of it. Sorry, mute, not on. Um, for This is for you, Chad. Um, thoughts on payment parity for telehealth, potential impact on overall cost and impact on providers. Your, some of your slides covered that, um, but you may want to... Yeah, exact, you know, absolutely. Um, I know that's a big policy topic right now. I think that I, I'm a strong believer in payment parity. So if, if there's, um, if you're providing a virtual service, um, or if you're, I'm sorry, if you're providing an E&M service, um, in person or virtual, you should the provider should be paid the same so that they can kind of make a decision what's clinically appropriate. Um, there's no over incentive or disincentive to perform virtual care. So I'm a strong believer in that. Uh, with that said, I don't know necessarily if you have to uh, regulate it through law or whether you know health insurance companies will kind of make that decision. I know some some insurers are already paying at parity levels. So um, specifically, whether or not that needs to be through law or whether that needs to just be through the goodwill of insurance companies. I don't know the answer to that, but I will tell you that I am a strong believer in payment parity. Um, it all it takes as someone who's been in, worked in virtual care operations for four years, trying to get providers to do virtual care prior to the pandemic, I'll tell you that the, the biggest barrier has been just fragmentation of payment. So if there's one insurance company that's not paying for it, um, and then you're not sure what to tell the patient, you know, you're, you, you may tell them that, you know, you come back and see me, and this may be the $20 copay that you normally pay or come back and see me that and this may be a $120 bill. It's just, it's very hard from a provider standpoint. So that little bit of a, a resistance causes people just to say, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to risk that in a busy provider's practice. Thank you both. Okay. I think we'll, we'll be ready to move on to our next um, co-presenters. Our next session is going to be on standards uh, for the new norm. And we have Mary Graham and Kim Batchelder with us um, to cover uh, from the, um, the Michigan Health Information Network Shared Services, otherwise known as MyHIN. <clears throat> Mary's the manager at MyHIN. Mary has spent five years with Great Lakes Health Connect before bringing her skills to MyHIN and is eager to continue her focus on provider-centered services, supporting the care community, improving health and outcomes, and reducing healthcare costs. She has served as adjunct faculty at Grand Valley State University and has extensive experience working in both behavioral health and developmental disabilities area. In addition, Mary spent two decades in managed care working with provider communities across the state. We'll also introduce Kim Batchelder at this time. Kim is the Senior Health Product Marketing Manager for Social Determinants of Health, e-consent, and telehealth at MyHIN. Kim comes to MyHIN with 10 years of experience with the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. She held multiple roles with MDHHS related to data sharing. She is driven in realizing business benefits by utilizing health information technology and data exchange to improve user experience, quality, and cost effectiveness. So we welcome now Mary and Kim. Turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Kathy. And can you confirm that you see my screen? Yes. All right. Thank you all. And thank you for letting us uh, join you here today. Kim has uh, been texting me that she's having some technology issues and her reception is choppy. So I will be doing a, um, the intro and the out, uh, the outgo, and she's going to be taking the middle. And I may step in if we don't end up with good audio for you. She's also not going to be sharing her screen, her um, video, because again, it will interfere with the reception. And we want you to have a good experience and get as much information as you can. So uh, first off, we're going to talk a little bit about MyHIN, the Michigan Health Information Network of Shared Services. And then we're going to talk about um, telehealth and teleregistry. And that will be Kim. And then we will talk a little bit about what you should expect from applications and services, uh, both from the pro provider and the patient um, aspect. 
so um, this is the my hint slide and most of you are probably familiar but we like to kind of renew and review simply because uh, it is a lot out there and there's always more that we're going to be looking at um, providing for the state but it's really about the triple aim and you're all familiar with that reducing cost improving the patient experience and improving outcomes so this slide gets busy really quickly, um, but that's really the nature of healthcare out there. Um, everybody has their finger in, in the mix here and working on um, healthcare and trying to get that normalized and standardized uh, so that we really can coordinate standardized and get the care information at the point of care and time of service that's needed. Since all these different systems don't necessarily talk to each other, we encourage and um, ask that folks get that to us and then we can send that back out in a normalized and standardized fashion. And the way we do that is through use cases. And what you see here is a developmental um, schema that goes from left to right. Uh, we really start with the conceptual aspects of a use case. What will be the benefit to the patient and the providers and the healthcare ecosystem? Then planning and development, implementation, and then going into mature production. Um, you can see that we've got a few new ones here in the gray on the left because that is what we're working on even during the time and supporting the state with the COVID testing and reporting. And the one you don't see on the slide is in fact telehealth and teleregistries. Kim and I have been working on that since March and I have experience with teleregistry or telehealth having stood up um, initial telehealth offering at Priority Health. And I found the data that shared by Seth and Chandy very interesting and relative to our experience and I might touch on that later. But I'm going to turn it over now to Kim and go to the next slide so she can start telling you about what we're doing here at MyHen in the, in the realm of telehealth in supporting our providers and patients. Thank you, Mary. Hi, I'm just going to do a quick sound check. How, do I sound a little choppy? No, you sound great. Okay, perfect. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Um, Mary for that introduction and, and thank you MSU Health Policy for inviting us to, to present today and thank you all for joining uh, today to let us present our view and, and plans on, on telehealth. Um, next slide please. Um, so now this is, this is uh, the maturity model of virtual health as we see it and what we've learned over experience in the past few months. Um, Pre-COVID, um, as you know, it has been discussed before, there are, you know, there are various uh, telehealth services in types, for example, there's phone, chat, video, et cetera, and various vendors in the market. Adoption had been slow. Um, In-person care was, was the standard. Uh, and telehealth was seen as an option or an add-on. And then again, as we were discussing before, uh, payment and regulations vary, especially within state to state. Um, during COVID, uh, video became oh, uh, telehealth had a rapid and broad adoption to meet the needs um, of providers and patients in order to keep the visits going, um, especially during social distancing. Um, payment and licensures became uh, less restrictive, which um, at this, this is something we see needs to feel uh, to continue um, post pandemic to ease the burden off of the providers. Um, and then post COVID and beyond, um, you know, what we're really focusing on is, is the need to work towards having telehealth embedded in the patient-centered medical home model and the community practices. Uh, we need to encourage simplified ways for providers and patients to access telehealth and the information needed for a telehealth visit to occur from both a provider and patient perspective. And finally, we need to encourage consumers or patients' um, autonomy by integrating clinical and social health into telehealth solutions to encourage easy access and easy access to data um, or information during those telehealth visits between the patient and the provider. Next slide. So as you see here, not all telehealth solutions are the same. Uh, some telehealth solutions that have been used are not HIPAA compliant due to rapid adoption and you know, the COVID, COVID needs uh, during, during the heat of the pandemic. The baseline for telehealth solutions are HIPAA compliant. Some meet the, some meet the care team needs. Um, as you see on, on the green side or the right side of this 
this graph, these solutions um, are working with providers to get the info needed to support care coordination from various uh, types of technology platforms they're using. This is the new normal of telehealth as we see it, which is much more valuable to patients um, and it engages them and is more person-centered. Uh, Next slide. Because all of these solutions are out there, or um, vendors are out there, um, it can be confusing with the complexity of all of these, these platforms. There's lots of different uh, ways to access these solutions. Uh, so we are actively working on a statewide telehealth registry that will assist payers to provide a streamlined experience for their members to drive patients um, access to care remotely. Um, and we're doing this through the, um, the, the use case that the use case process that Mary has um, seen earlier. So this is kind of in that gray and um, dark gray area of, of the developmental stage and, and, and partner and in, in development stage. Next slide. Um, what we're planning is we will integrate into payers portal so a member can log into their member portal, navigate to a designated telehealth page where the member can search for their provider, get the information needed to set up a virtual visit easily and seamlessly without having to search for that information in multiple places. Because as we see that, um, from, from feedback from uh, the provider and the patient perspective, Sometimes the patients can get lost in trying to um, find what telehealth system or vendor um, each one of their providers are using. Um, so based off of that feedback, that we believe that telehealth registry will help streamline and make it kind of one point of access where we can um, give patients that, that information so they're not out there kind of lost in the marketplace trying to find what telehealth solution matches which one of their providers. So in order to do this, we will, we will be using the suite of services um, and use cases and tools we have here at MyHand. And, um, and to talk a little bit more about this, I'm gonna pass it back over to, to my colleague, Mary, to talk about uh, some of those tools and services and use cases within MyHand. Yep, thank you, Kim. Um, you may have heard over, over the past months uh, that Great Lakes Health Connect and MyHen affiliated at the end of 2019. We've all been distracted with COVID since then, but we've all been busy as well. Um, and of course, here at MyHen, we've been combining the things that Great Lakes Health Connect brought to the table with the work that MyHen had been doing. We are both mature um, tele and digital uh, platforms and services with slightly so what we've done those two together and looking for ways to implement and serve the state of Michigan and the providers and the patients by doing so. So the use case uh, paradigm and emphasis of my hen has really focused on how do we get the data and standardize, normalize the services across the different systems and services that are out there in the state of Michigan. And what Great Lakes Health Connect did was build services and, and tools that could fill the gap when needed. In other words, if you needed a specific sort of solution, we could help and step in. So now we have both. And we wanna make sure that folks understand that MyHen is vendor agnostic. In other words, we are really focusing on working on getting you what you need at the time of service and point of care, but also that if you needed a, a specific application, um, that we could also step into that space if need be not trying to sell anything. We want to make sure that you understand. And so with it, I show you the next slides, we're really focusing on what we want to um, set as a standard for telehealth services. So when we look at um, particular telehealth application, what should it do for you? What should it do for you as a patient and what should it do for you as the provider? There's, um, and so this is a specific offering. This is Care Convene, which is, uh, has a relationship with my hand. Care Convene Plus would be the base model, and it should really focus on, can you get on demand? And I'm gonna, don't look at the branding here, think about the services that are de being delivered and by a telehealth um, application. Can it do on demand, as needed appointments that are initiated by the patient? And can it also support scheduled, patient, uh, scheduled visits? Is it simple to access and use? 
can it do chat, video, and or phone? Because both of the prior speakers addressed the fact that in rural areas, sometimes they only have a flip phone and they're just going to be doing um, phone visits or they don't have broadband and they can't do computer-based work. So how can we support the patient no matter what their digital um, reality is? Can you do symptom management? In other words, if you are able to access the application, can you actually monitor and make your diabetes? Could you do screening for COVID symptoms before you haven't left the house? Um, and can you do virtual consults with your um, colleagues as a provider? These are all some of the base functionality that we think should be part of a robust telehealth service. This is a view that shows you a couple of different things and it really shows you what it looks like in a phone but also what it looks like in a computer because the, at the office, the providers are probably going to want to be using their, their application, their um, actual their computer. It's just easier, it's more nimble, it's bigger, they, they don't have to, they can actually type. Um, and the other thing that you'll notice on the screen is that it's HIPAA compliant. These are the other two things that we want to make sure that uh, folks understand as key elements for a telehealth service, is that it's HIE enabled, it should be supporting health information exchange, the work that you've done here in Michigan to create um, a robust health information exchange that's best in class nationally, getting that data, standardizing it, normalizing it, delivering it back to the point of care. You want the telehealth to be part of that and kind of stand alone when it was a higher gun kind of doctor relationship, Amwell, MD Live, Teladoc. These were all competing with the PCMH and we really want to focus on the fact that that should change. We should have telehealth services that are in fact supporting the PCMH, the patient center medical home, supporting the physicians relative to payment and regulation, and um, supporting the patients, providing them an option that isn't the urgent care and ERs after hours and on weekends, and also making sure that it's easy to access and that they can get the services that they need. And since we don't know where we're going to go with COVID um, and we're have, seeing the numbers tip, tick back up, um, there's also the option of screening before you ever leave the house so that folks know whether they should be leaving and, and the doctors can monitor getting that information right into the office. So support for current crises, support long-term for continuing telehealth, and support, as Kim mentioned, and I know that we're, we're not taking our full time, but that's okay. Um, so really support around the idea that with a teleregistry, we can normalize all the different services. Because you've seen in Kim's slides and with the prior presenters that lots of, uh, lots of providers stood up services in the midst of the crisis in order to maybe make sure that they could take care of patients. What we're hearing is patients are saying to us that I have three people in my home and they have three different doctors. That's nine different platforms. We don't know how to get where we were supposed to go when we have an appointment or a need. A teleregistry can really simplify that because you have one place to go, supported perhaps by your pl health plan, and you can pick the, the different doctor and then immediately go to that particular um, service. So that's what we're trying to accomplish with a teleregistry and I hope you understand the, the takeaways that we really want to focus on, which is support for PCMH and support for the patient. And with that, I can be done. Thanks very much, um, Mary and Kim. Kim, you sounded good the whole time. There were no connectivity issues. Happy to have, tell you that. And we don't have any questions right now, but perhaps we will um, in wrap up. Uh, we do have a wrap up question that came in from the previous, wait, maybe we do. Um, let me take this one and then the, um, there was a question about measurement and outcomes and I think I'll take that, at, that one at the very end and put it out to all the panelists. Um, so as a result of the need for social distancing, telehealth regulation, regulatory and licensure requirements have been significantly relaxed. What are thoughts on changes in telehealth regulation on an ongoing basis? Is there a silver lining to pandemic deregulation? Mary, Kim, but really anybody. I'll take it. I, I especially, if, <laughs> um, I'll start off because my experience when I was at the health plan, um, excuse me, I'll put my camera back on, um, really was that 
uh, can't find my mouse. There it is. The, the health plan really was that when we did surveys post visit with our telehealth vendor, um, there, the folks that responded to the surveys told us that their other option would be to go to the e urgent care and, um, the ER, the emergency department. When you're looking at a replacement for um, on-demand, high acuity, low, low complexity visits, um, somebody is gonna be going to the ER, that's their option, or they're gonna be getting somebody that's uh, a doctor that's not part of their normal care team. So with the expansion of telehealth, I really do think it's going to increase access to your own primary care and your treatment team. That's a win for me as a patient, and for the, the care team. So I think um, that's the first win. The second win is that the payment has been really changed by the health plans. And if that continues, that's really an advantage as well because telehealth has been around since the invention of the telephone. It just wasn't really recognized and it wasn't part of the treatment modality. Whereas we changed everything else we've done relative to how we do business in the world. We shop online, we bank online, we do everything else online. And the quality of the visits, I'm sure that the, the providers can really step up and make sure that it's a valuable and meaningful and um, appropriate experience. I'm not worried about that at all. The third thing is that the regulation should change. Licensure, for instance, for the snowbirds and people that are traveling, if they haven't seen their doctor recently or there is an agreement to see that doctor when they're out of state, that was a, always a barrier. Um, and that also has apparently changed or is at least under review so that if I'm in Wisconsin, I can still see my Michigan doctors. Um, all of those are really high, high visibility, high impact benefits that came really from a, a very terrible um, episode with COVID. At least in my opinion, I'm not a, I'm not a medical provider. Any other panelists want to take that? Sure, I, I'd love to take that. I think that um, the, the deregulation that occurred during the pandemic was significantly important for um, the adoption of telehealth beyond the needs for social distancing. And I'm a strong proponent of deregulation to allow telehealth to grow. And um, you know, the, like Kathy pointed out at the beginning, telehealth was, was paid for by Medicare for a very long time. For 20 years, they paid for it. But the reason that uh, there was less than 1% of rural patients in the country using telehealth and, and providers using telehealth is because of the this originating site requirement. And so requiring patients, they couldn't connect from home. They had to go to a medical facility in a health professional shortage area to connect. So that small piece of regulation kept telehealth less than 1% for about 20 years. And so removing that regulation in March 2020, along with these ad additional regulations, have enabled it to grow. And so in terms of regulation, any bit of fragmentation with what's covered, what's not covered, leads to people to go down the path of least resistance and not, and not do it. The path of least resistance for providers and health systems is still uh, patients arrive in the room, they walk from room to room to room and see patients. It's very easy. So adding something, investing in telehealth technologies, all that kind of stuff will not happen if there isn't a, uh, if, if there isn't head, like homogeneous deregulation uh, you know, among all different uh, payers for this. And I'll, I'll talk briefly about the um, licensure issue too. So um, you know, the example of snowboards is really important, but we have a bigger issue at, in Southeast Michigan where we have patients that are just 45 minutes away in Ohio that um, can't, that we see a big population of those patients and they can't necessarily do telehealth. They could under the rules of the pandemic, but because of the licensure rules, um, we have a hard stop built into our system if they're not physically located. So they have in, in the state. So we have to ask them to, you know, drive over state lines just to perform the visit. The, the regulations are just kind of unnecessary. And I think that the, I understand why they're there, but I think the volume is so low for us to understand the impact of some of that deregulation that we have to kind of loosen it, let it grow, and then find what the unintended consequences are and then fix those problems. So I wanted to chime in real quick, if I could. Um, you know, the deregulation was a big issue for us in Medicaid in terms of allowing us to open the floodgates, if you will. Um, and, you know, now with 
the, with the pandemic um, and opening up a lot of our policies, some of the questions we're asking is, you know, our, our intent with these policies was to continue them, to stop them once the emergency declaration had ended. But now even we're re-looking at these policies and saying, you know, I think there's a lot of value in this. And we're also communicating that to our federal partners and to you know, other lawmakers to say, you know, yeah, the law is a little bit narrow. I know they opened it up during the pandemic, but maybe we ought to consider softening those, those lines. Um, so I agree with you. I think we've learned a lot about telemedicine throughout this COVID-19 issue. Thanks. Thanks to all the <clears throat> presenters. And Jackie, excellent segue. Uh, Jackie Prokop is our next um, presenter. Um, she just answered that question. I apologize, Jackie, that we didn't introduce you earlier. Okay. Um, Je <laughs> she is the last, but absolutely not the least, um, of our presenter panelists today. Jackie is the Director of Medicaid Program Policy in the State Medicaid Agency of the Michigan Department of Health and Human Services. She has provided leadership for the state of Michigan for over 27 years, with most of those years working in the state Medicaid agency. In her current role, she oversees <clears throat> health policy related to Medicaid, the Healthy Michigan Plan, maternity outpatient medical services, the Flint Waiver, and the My Child Program. She has a bachelor's degree in nursing, a master's degree in healthcare administration, and a PhD in nursing with an emphasis in health policy, in addition to over 10 years of clinical experience in a variety of health settings. I will turn it to Jackie. All right, thank you, Kathy. And I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, be on the panel today. I've actually learned so much from the other presenters. And um, I'm fine when I, when I was putting together the presentation with my colleagues, um, I felt like we still had so many questions. And ironically, it's relaxing to hear you all seem to have some of the similar questions regarding telehealth. So today's presentation, I'm going to focus on um, what, we, what we had covered in regards to telemedicine, and then an overview of our new telemedicine policies that came out as a result of COVID-19. Um, I actually have some data on the telemedicine utilization, which is fun because it kind of mirrors some of what the other speakers had found where our utilization rates were, did go up significantly. Um, and then in May, June timeframe, there was some new uh, legislation that was passed. And I'm going to briefly touch on where we are in terms of our policies and then talk about our next steps and what we plan to do. So for starters, when we looked at releasing our telemedicine policy, we actually had one that was in the works and it was going through our Medicaid promulgation process, which is roughly about a hundred day time period for it to go through the whole process. And we were actually putting it out for public comment in early March and then COVID hit and we said, you know what, we need to put this policy out right away. So we submitted it, we sent it out for a dual public and final, which just means providers can begin using telemedicine right away. And we backdated the policy um, before the issue date so that if telemedicine visits had occurred, providers could bill us for it. When we um, determine what it is we're going to cover and what laws, or what we're going to cover in regards to telemedicine, one of the first places we have to look is what is allowed from the federal and from the state regulatory standpoint, which is a really nice segue from our recent conversation. I'm not gonna read what's on the screen, but there are definitions and there are regulations regarding telemedicine and which provides a framework of which we need to stay within. Um, so when, when the March policy went out, it certainly was within these guidelines. Um, another thing is there's a lot of detail regarding the originating and distant site provider and some of the requirements there. Um, our March policy went out with those guidelines in place, but then of course with COVID-19, the feds opened things up and so we followed suit in, in that regard. Um, there was actually uh, more, in, there was more relaxation of the HIPAA guidelines too, so we followed suit as well. Um, another thing that I wanted to mention is that when when providers are doing telemedicine, um, they have to make sure they still get beneficiary consent and they also have to have a, a contingency plan in place. So if they're doing a telemedicine visit, they need to be able to respond appropriately should a problem be found, such as sending them to the ER or some sort of follow-up plan. When you think about telemedicine, um, it really does impact a lot of different areas of medicine. Um, and I'm not gonna read all the details on the screen here, but I think it gives you a flavor of all the different areas um, that telemedicine can impact. Um, you know, certainly a lot of people think about the office visits with their um, physicians, um, but there's also inpatient consultations, there's diabetes self-management, 
Um, dentistry, that was something that before COVID-19 um, hit, we really hadn't considered doing telemedicine for dentists. You know, and there are some procedures that dentists can do through telemedicine, so we were quick to uh, submit a, send out a policy to allow that. Um, physical therapy, that has already been touched on uh, by a previous presenter, that there are some physical PT, OT, and ST services that can be provided through uh, telemedicine. Nursing facility and, you know, behavioral health and substance abuse was another big area where a lot of telemedicine was really performed. Um, but one thing I want to mention is, though there are a lot of providers that can perform telemedicine, what they can do actually is rather limited. Um, when we opened up the telemedicine codes, um, providers perform a service and they bill it using a code. And so we identified what codes that providers could bill using telemedicine. In fact, when COVID-19 hit, um, we felt the need to communicate as best we could with providers, not only releasing policies, but also creating a database for all the the new telemedicine codes that we were covering, um, and also ones that could be performed by telephone only, which was a big change when COVID-19 hit. Um, but I, what I wanted to mention is that it's not as though like with physical therapy, with PT and OT, they can perform all their services through telemedicine. And certainly with dentistry, you can't get, teeth, you know, you can't get your teeth cleaned through telemedicine, um, but there are certain services that a dentist still can provide. And so we had to work through all those details and write that up in policy. Um, and when we sent out our COVID-19 related policies, um, we sent those out both dual, final, and public comment so that providers could begin billing, performing these services and billing right away. And also if they thought we, maybe we didn't go far enough with our um, policies that we at least could have that comment and we could change the policy as needed. Um, providers that can uh, provide services are, includes physician and other qualified health providers. Um, they have to be licensed in the state of Michigan or be under contract with a, with a certain entity that is enrolled with Medicaid, um, provide services within their scope of practice, and they also have to be enrolled in CHAMPS, which is our Medicaid claims processing system. Um, all the providers that provide Medicaid services have to be enrolled in CHAMPS. So I want to give a quick overview of our Medicaid policy bulletin. So when COVID hit the middle of, uh, of um, March, um, we actually sent out over 20 Medicaid policy bulletins in about 60 days, and five or six of them were related specifically to telemedicine. Um, it was very fast paced. Um, and you can see at the top, there's MSA 2009, which is considered, uh, we call that a permanent policy. That was something that was already in the works, and that will stay as is. Um, and of course, you can read that it, it expanded the originating sites to include local health departments and home. That was a big thing is that we didn't cover um, patient visits from home and that was something that you know we follow Medicare rules typically or we're always watching other private insurers to see what they're doing so that we stay you know consistent with the industry. Um, we relaxed the distance site for providers. Again you know there was regulations that providers could only provide these services in certain settings um, so we, we, we did relax that. Um, and then to a degree with payment parity, um, we allowed the, uh, the federally qualified health centers and, and rural health centers to receive their prospective payment reimbursement um, for these types of uh, visits. And we had to make that clear in policy. So another thing that happened is we also sent out MSA uh, policy 2034. And again, these policies, some of these are several pages long and these are just the highlights of them. Um, this allowed, the RHCs or the health centers and the, the tribal health clinics to receive the, their prospective payment reimbursement when it was audio only for telephones. We didn't have a policy that said if you perform um, an office visit using telephone only that they could get their full reimbursement. So that had to be sent out very quick. And one thing I want to also highlight is with all of our COVID-19 response policies, when we sent those out, Within every policy, it said it's really for the COVID-19 timeframe um, and that when the public health emergency uh, ends, these policies will let you know what will end as part of that. Um, so we're still kind of working through exactly what we're going to keep after this. But I just wanted to point out that our intent for these COVID-19 policies was that they were going to end, but we're learning so much that now it's kind of like, hmm, we need to probably keep some of these going. Um, Last one, uh, MSA 2013 just talks about um, our telemedicine database and that we allowed providers to do telephone only visits. Again, we had to have a policy in place so that this was all clear. 
And a lot of these policies, even though they may have come out in April, a lot of them we backdated to like March 1st. Uh, MSA 2022 uh, allows for physical therapy, occupational therapy. So we came out with a limited set of codes for them to provide services. Um, MSA 2021 um, allows, I spoke about the dentist and how they could do, there's one or two codes that they can bill. So they can do a, a limited exam with a, a beneficiary via telemedicine. Um, <clears throat> and, and then 2042, um, I know my colleagues on the panel will like this. It ensures that there's parity and reimbursement. Um, with telemedicine, we have the option of paying something called the facility rate versus the non-facility rate. And the non-facility rate would be the same amount that you would get if a patient came into your office and you billed for an office visit. And this policy just clarifies that we're gonna to continue to pay that rate. It's the same as if you had seen a patient in your office. And we felt that was important in regards to, um, you know, during the pandemic, the stay at home orders, um, we had also heard, you know, anecdotally that a lot of people were very uncomfortable seeing their provider face to face, but yet they needed access to healthcare. So we tried to do our best to make sure that people had access to healthcare. So I want to talk a little bit about utilization, and it's interesting because I think my data mir my data does mirror what um, some of my colleagues had presented. So you could see in January and February, you know, we did have some telemedicine um, visits that were already in place. Um, again, it was, it was very limited. Um, and you could see that there were a couple of thousand visits that were done during that time frame. But then in March, when our policies were released, and in April, you can see how it just really skyrockets. And so with, let me introduce real quickly, the blue line is the total number of um, telemedicine visits that were done. And the yellow or orange line here um, is actually the number of unique beneficiaries that were served. So roughly about 160,000 beneficiaries had roughly 237, 240,000 visits. Um, you'll note that it does quickly drop off with May, June, and July, which is consistent with what my, um, my colleague on the panel had mentioned, that people are starting to go back and, and having more face-to-face -face visits. <clears throat> the other thing I wanted to mention with the data is this data was pulled literally as of last uh, Wednesday or Thursday. I wanted to have the most up-to-date data for this presentation. Um, and sometimes there's problems with claim lag. So really the June numbers in July, if we pulled this in another month or so, it would probably be higher. But you know, to us, it was nice to see that people were, had, had, were getting access to care and that, well, our and that our policy bulletins were being read. We're always happy about that. Um, so this I thought was interesting when we looked at who was providing the telemedicine visits. Um, we thought we wanted to pull up the 237,000 like in one month. Um, actually, this is all that we had in our system. But it's interesting that you can see the physicians, uh, the two of the physician specialties were right at the top with internal medicine and family medicine, that that's where most of the visits, you know, a larger percent of the visits were um, completed. Um, a lot of social worker visits. I think this um, speaks to the mild to moderate um, care that's provided by both the health plans and fee for service. And one thing I did neglect to say, and I apologize for this, the previous slide really is slide really shows utilization for our Medicaid from our Medicaid health plans and fee for service. I actually have a separate slide that shows what our PIHPs um, had provided during the same time frame. Um, so. Just going down the list, I'm not gonna go through all the details, all the different providers, but it certainly gives you a flavor of who it is was being seen, you know, who, what type of providers that people were reaching out to and having visits during this time. <clears throat> One thing I wanted to highlight was the maternal infant health program. Now here's something where COVID really changed our view on this program. We had felt strongly for years that um, we really wanted the nurses. This is a program where nurses and social workers and dietitians will go in and see pregnant women and babies within the first year of life and perform visits. And we had always required every visit to be face to face. Well, during, uh, you know, once COVID-19 hit, we had heard back from the providers that a lot of the patients just weren't comfortable having a nurse come in. You know, they're pregnant, they don't want to be exposed to COVID, but yet they really wanted to have access to these services. Um, so then we did allow for the maternal infant health program to begin having um, uh, telemedicine visits. And we have found that actually it has worked out, it has worked out very well. 
So another thing we looked at in regards to, and again, this is from the Medicaid health plan data and from fee-for-service, we combined the data, was by race who was using um, telemedicine. And I'm not sure how well you can see the screen. Sorry, the, 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 um, the font's a little bit small, but the blue is uh, non-migrant white. The orange here is non-migrant black. And then um, there's also number five is uh, non-migrant Hispanic. And then the numbers just, they seem to kind of collapse. And this is something that as we, we look towards the future of telemedicine, um, it's, it's very important that we're monitoring, you know, who is using it by age, which is my next slide, or one of my next slides, and also looking at racial disparities. Because I think if we continue to find um, significant racial disparities, we're going to have to um, put an intervention in place and, and address that. But for right now, we're collecting data and we're looking at it and analyzing it and thinking about um, how we move forward in the future. <clears throat> so this slide, um, again, this is different from the other slides. Um, this is just data from our PIHPs and CMHs, so th which tends to serve a population that has more moderate to severe mental illness. Um, and you can see in March, the light green bar here of 101,000 visits. Um, what this shows is the number of um, visits that were performed uh, for mental health. And the blue at the top is related to SUD. So that's what they, that was the purpose of their visit. <clears throat> and I find this very interesting that April and of course May, you can see the timing of our policy bulletins, it just shot right up. And June, it still continues to go up. And you'll see that July really went down. I think that has a lot to do with claim lag. It usually takes a good 60 days, I think, for all of this to come into the system and to, um, and to show up. Um, but I think this is consistent with what had been presented earlier, um, is that we are finding that for mental health and, and SUD visits, that people really are preferring the telemedicine over the face-to-face. Um, so that, again, you know, it wasn't what we expected to see when we let the COVID, you know, we sent the COVID policies out. Um, I know they're also using a lot of telephone visits. Um, you know, again, I don't think telephone visits is something that we would have really considered without COVID-19, but with it, we found that it is very useful. Um, but there's a lot of um, things that we still need to consider with, reg you know, deregulation. Will telephone visits be able to continue? And if so, in what form? So we're still working through that. But I just am really, it's very interesting to see the number of visits that were performed. So this is, next slide is the use of telemedicine by age. And I'm sure most of you quickly go to the, the point here that where it hit, once it hits 65 to 69 age range, thinking, oh my gosh, it really drops off for this age, this population. I just wanna remind everyone, this is Medicaid data. And when people reach the age of 65, they could be on Medicare. So I think what's happening here, I'm assuming these bars would actually be much higher if we had the Medicare data as well. We would only get crossover claims. So I don't think we have the full information on how many people had a telemedicine visit with Medicare. It just wouldn't, it simply wouldn't show up here. But it does seem that throughout the different age brackets that it seems to be, I think, pretty stable in terms of there was a lot of utilization. Um, and it was kind of encouraging to see. So I, I also mentioned that I wanted to touch um, on some of the um, House bills that had passed around the May-June timeframe. Um, and just from a high level, um, you know, House Bill 5414 and 5412 and 13, they sort of tweaked the definition of telemedicine um, and to the insurance code. And what I wanted to just mention is that um, when we write our policies, we looked at the, the state laws and the federal, and we actually point to them in the policy, and we indicate that we are in compliance with those particular um, laws. And so if they do change, we still are pointing to it. Um, so we do believe our policies are up to date. And you know, I think what was happening is these House bills were moving through the legislative process as our policies were too. So I think we are aligned in our thinking. Um, House Bill uh, 5415 speaks of remote patient monitoring services. Um, these are things that we have been covering for a while. And as new, um, um, new things come out on the market, we look at them and we look at the efficacy of their ability uh, to help a patient and we add them to our coverage as appropriate. And so we do look at those regularly. 
Um, and then House Bill 5416, um, it talks about telemedicine services covered under the Medical Assistance Program in Healthy Michigan and allowing for in-home and school setting. Um, and here again, we um, were compliant. We were making changes to our policy, I think as this was going through the legislative process as well. So going forward, I mentioned that we, we had a number of policies that we sent out related to COVID-19 that really changed uh, our way of you know, covering services related to telemedicine or telehealth. But as we're looking forward, once the, um, once the public health emergency ends, we have to decide exactly what services we're going to retain and what we're, we're going to have to end. And I wanted to give people sort of a glimpse of some of the things that we are considering as we are moving through this process. And we by no means have made any final decisions yet. I think we still are having more questions than answers. Um, but some of the things we're thinking of is ensuring beneficiary privacy and security. I mean, that should be really at the forefront as well. Um, ensuring effectiveness of service for beneficiaries. You know, one of the questions that we're asking is, is a telephone visit equal to an in-person visit? Is there a time when you should have telephone visits? And if so, should people have 10 visits in a row? You know, you know how, do we, how do we have this mix of, because I think, um, I think there's a lot of value in patients seeing their provider face to face, but I could see why a telephone visit would also be appropriate. So we're still working through those details. Um, it's also important to maintain appropriate access, um, you know, for the beneficiary, for the doctor even, um, and ensuring the appropriate beneficiary choice. Um, and I think, you know, number four is that we were looking at the, uh, the mental health data from the PIHPs. Um, it just, you know, I, we're always wondering if there's better access to care, if they have this option. So we're, we're looking through those things as well. Um, ensuring providers are utilizing telemedicine appropriately and, you know, value considerations, you know, are outcomes, health outcomes going to remain the same? Will they improve? Will they decline? You know, how does this all fit into the equation? So our next steps, um, actually we have formed an internal um, work group within the department. Um, and we have people from behavioral health, managed care, um, pe people from all the different policy areas as we're looking at this. Um, and again, looking at it from a few different angles. Um, and just looking at, you know, what is it with, with, with the COVID-19 response, what should we retain? Um, at this point, we are coming up with a proposal and we feel that we also need to look at what other states are doing, what other insurers are doing, and we need to collect more information. But I think it kind of starts with us internally um, identifying what we think would be the most appropriate response once the pandemic ends. Um, but we also know that I don't think we have all the answers and we will need to also st um, seek stakeholder input before we can come up with our final recommendation. So we continue to work through things as well. and and not only identifying more questions, but trying to answer them along the way. So there's my contact information and that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, Jackie, very much. <clears throat> As I'm sure is obvious to our participants today, our panelists, um, payment is driving a lot of the utilization. And as we know, Medicaid is one of the biggest payers in Michigan. Um, so we really appreciate your perspective, Jackie. While it's a, a government program versus commercial, several of our presenters also have mentioned uh, the commercial perspective. Um, since we have a few minutes and only one question on deck, I've got um, some comments of my own and a couple questions to pose um, to all of you. Um, I, Jackie, you may not be aware of this, but um, when I started as the director of Children's Special Health Care Services in 2003, um, mail came one day and it was a VHS um, cassette tape and it was, um, put together by parents um, in the Upper Peninsula, parents of children with special health care needs, begging the state um, to reimburse uh, telemedicine because it was such a challenge um, and, and really, you know, a cost to their families, not, not just financial, uh, to transport these very medically complex, often severely disabled children all the way to the lower third of our, of our very large state, you know, to the quaternary tertiary care centers. Um, so that was my introduction uh, to telemedicine and the, the issue of the policy was um, this heartbreaking uh, videotape that arrived um, showing the complexity of what it would take for a family of children with special health care needs to transport their children. Um, 
And as anybody who's ever um, served a Medicaid beneficiary or worked in the state Medicaid agency, we know what a challenge transportation is. Um, it was one of the um, most um, intractable problems I dealt with um, as the Medicaid director before I left as the Children's Special Healthcare Services director is the challenges um, around transport, transportation for the Medicaid population. Do we have data at this point of what has happened um, with the transportation benefit is now that we've had this um, surge in telemedicine visits? Has, has there been, I mean, I'm assuming there's been an offsetting cost, but I'm curious if you have data on that, Jackie. I don't have data on that, but it is something that we're looking at. Um, it's, we had another COVID-19 policy related to transportation where we really opened things up. We had uh, a policy that stated if <clears throat> somebody was picking up a beneficiary and they had a couple that they could pick up along the way to take to a doctor that they should consolidate and, and provide the transportation that way. Of course, our policy came out and said, because of social distancing, you can take everyone individually. So it's hard to know what's really offsetting there. Um, you know, getting the data is a big thing. In transportation, there's even more of a delay, I think, in getting the data, but it's something that we are going to be looking at. Dr. Chad, have you, um, has telehealth impacted no-show rates? Has that, has there been an impact there? Yeah, we've seen a slight decrease in, in no-show rates, um, especially in neurology, but I, um, don't know about the, the connection to, um, uh, to transportation. And again, I'm saying, speaking overall, so not, not necessarily specifically about um, uh, Medicaid versus commercial. We haven't looked specifically kind of during March, um, April, May, June. We, um, just because there was re other reasons for that the data may not be as clear, but we did look pre-pandemic. Um, we actually published on that, looking at the impact of um, no show rates and actually there was no statistical difference between the two uh, c control population of in person versus versus video but you you definitely feel the uh, no show rate more because you're you know you're sitting there waiting and then they don't show up whereas in clinic you may be busy doing other things and not even realize that two or, two or three of your patients didn't show up for their visit so uh, there were, anecdotally people have felt that there were more no show rates when we looked at the actual numbers prior to the pandemic the, the rates were the same yeah, I mean, we're, we're also seeing it's a kind of a no-show rate for telehealth, so to speak, in the sense that providers are have block time for telehealth visits and they're not getting filled, mainly because we couldn't, you know, get drum up the interest or the education or the promotion from the, the patient side. So again, not, not the um, a no-show in the formal sense, but still uh, emptied slots uh, because of uh, patients not signing up for telehealth. And then one last question for me before we um, wrap it up with our last question that's left in the Q&A box. Um, is data available yet on impact on childhood immunizations? That's probably to Jackie or Seth. I'll start and <laughs> Seth can chime yeah, in. I'm just getting myself off mute. <laughs> um, you know that we're very concerned about it on the Medicaid side. Um, you know, we, we know that telehealth visits were done on children and of course they can't give them the immunization because they're not coming into the office. Um, we actually have just sent out a provider letter uh, reminding physicians, especially pediatricians, about the importance of doing the well child visits and bringing um, the kids in for their immunizations. Um, I think I have heard uh, through the department uh, with the immunization division that they have said that the numbers are going down. So it's something that we're actually looking at um, doing more outreach to providers, getting people in. Yeah, I don't have, don't have data on it yet, but I know that there's, um, there obviously was a delay on vaccinations and now there's a catch up. Um, you know, I, I would fully catch up uh, with all the missed vaccination or the delayed ones, not, not sure, but there was definitely, uh, um, there's, there's definitely some sort of gap. Um, it could, guarantee you that but I just don't know what the how big it is and maybe that's maybe that's the issue great thanks to both of you so our last wrap-up question <clears throat> what are the right measurements outcomes that policymakers should focus on to objectively measure the success of telehealth policies utilization quality measures I'm gonna throw that out to all panelists Sure, I'll start. I'd say, well, so quality, uh, number one, and then uh, secondly, cost, especially in the, um, in the government payers. Um, 
I think those are the those would have the two biggest impacts. I mean, I think it's obvious on the on the cost part, um, you know, but the the quality. Um, I, I think we've got to we've got to see how this plays out. Uh, we probably need more data on you know the impact of of uh, telehealth on quality. Um, so, but um, I'll leave that to probably Chad can uh, talk more about the the quality piece. Yeah, no, I'm happy to talk about it. I mean, I, I, I typed the response in there. It's, this is a pretty big question. A lot of big organizations are looking at this. And I think that the, uh, you know, conceptually, the way that I think about it is that there are, there are telehealth measures, and then there's also um, existing quality measures, and how does telehealth enable improvement of those existing measures. And so um, I'll give you an example. So for the existing measures, uh, we know that in, in sickle cell disease, for example, that having access to preventative care services improves outcomes, direct clinical outcomes from sickle cell disease. But we know that there's a limited number of um, hematologists in the state that, that, that treat those patients specifically. And so um, telehealth there in that you don't have to necessarily look at telehealth visits because it will be difficult to say, um, you know, if you did five telehealth visits, do you have improved outcomes? Did you do, if you did only one, do you have improved outcomes? I think that's, there's going to get a lot of noise there. So really what you're looking at is just having access to telehealth. Does it improve those, those clinical measures? And, and the direct line is that just having access to the specialist, we know there's a lot of evidence that shows that it improves those measures. So that's, that's how it can improve clinical quality um, with existing measures. And then, and then specifically, I think telehealth should be utilized, but well, I mean, should be looked at, but not so much about how is it, the quality aspect, but more about, as Seth mentioned, the utilization. We don't want telehealth to be abused. We don't want it to lead to a lot of you know, overuse and unnecessary care. So looking at simple utilization measures, if you had a, uh, let's say one, one would be, you know, uh, revisits within seven days for the same condition. So if you had a um, patient that was seen for upper respiratory um, illness via televisit, are they within seven days seeing a primary care doctor or urgent care or emergency room for that same upper respiratory infection? And there's going to be a certain level where they're being seen again for the same condition, but does that statistically vary between the televisit versus the in-person visit? And if there's a difference there, that means that there may be some quality of care issues to address with telehealth. Um, also, um, the frequency of visits. So if you look at a specific group of diagnoses like, um, like depression, for example, um, if you have providers that are seeing patients every three months in person, but then um, with telehealth, they're seeing patients every month, um, you know, then you see a discrepancy there in utilization, and then you have to kind of reconcile that. Is that improving depression care, or is it just enabling, it's a low barrier way to, you know, improve revenue and use more of healthcare services. So, um, you know, thinking about those separately, the outcomes part, they should just enable existing measures, a lot of existing good measures out there. And then this, the um, utilization part needs to be looked separate, looked at separately. And, um, and just overall, I think that we don't, I don't have a direct answer to that. I've been trying to look at population level outcomes for many years. And I think that the, what we have to do is now we have the volume so we can actually look at this stuff. I just don't want it to all go away if you stop covering telehealth after the pandemic or after the public health emergency. Yeah, we're, I think we're pretty aligned in our thinking. Um, I don't know if there is one answer that fits all the different populations. Um, still, when I look at the data, I've been very interested in the fact of there seems to be a lot of access to mental health and SUD. There are some high numbers there and taking a look as to what's happening with that population and understanding how the telemedicine visits have really helped them. Um, to, from where I sit, I think there's a lot of questions. There's a lot of lenses we have to look through to, before we can come up with our final policy. Um, and I really think it's important to talk to providers and stakeholders and understand what's really happening out there on the front lines as they're working with beneficiaries. Um, I do think we'll have a more expansive telemedicine policy in the end. Um, I just don't know exactly what that's going to look like at this point in time. But I'm, you know, we are looking at, like I said, the mental health, I bet we'll, we'll probably be looked at a little bit differently and we'll be maybe more um, aggressive in terms of, of uh, what services we will allow. Um, it's been very interesting and I actually have been quite pleased with all the utilization so people are getting access to care. Well, thank you to all of our expert presenters today. This has been a fabulous session. 
this is really my first public role um, in my new job, in my new position with MSU Institute for Health Policy. So thank you for making um, this a great, a great success today. Uh, we, we all really appreciated your perspective and your glimpse into the future, not only on policy, but planning, implementation, and probably most importantly, um, outcome evaluation. I think that's what all of us are, are most concerned about. So thanks, thanks to all of you uh, for your time today. Thank you to our participants who stuck with us until the end of this session. And we look forward to another session in the future. Um, for, the, for our legislative partners on the phone, um, we of course are, or I mean on the Zoom, we are always looking to you uh, for ideas and feedback on how these sessions are going and what would be most useful for you. So please be sure to let us know um, what you'd like for future presentations. Any last words on for anyone? Arnold, anything to add? Otherwise, I think we're ready Hi, to John wrap Kathy, up. Uh, thank you for uh, moderating. Thanks to all the uh, panelists. Great. It was a great information, very timely. Um, greatly appreciated your time today. And uh, thank you again to the uh, Michigan Health Endowment Fund for allowing us uh, to present this opportunity to uh, legislators and legislative staff in particular. We'll wrap up today. Thanks again, everyone. Have Thank a great you. day. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.